Hello, bookworms. Welcome to The Best Book Ever, the podcast where we talk about your favorite books. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and today I'm so pleased to talk to Susie Bangora. Susie is a Sierra Leonean, Ghanaian, British bookstagrammer based in the southwest of England. She loves sharing her current reads, recommendations, and what she calls way too many stacks of newly acquired books on Instagram, despite her self-imposed book buying bans. I am a huge fan of Susie's vibrant Instagram account, especially her thoughtful book reviews and her hilarious reels. I'm so excited for you to hear Susie tell me why So the Path Does Not Die by P.D. Hollis is the best book ever. Bookworms, one quick note before we start. The book we discuss today does deal with the topic of female genital mutilation. Though my conversation with Susie is not at all graphic, I did want to let you know that we talk about it. If that's a trigger point for you, you might want to skip this episode. Hi, Susie. Welcome to the Best Book Ever podcast. Hi, Julie. Thank you so much for inviting me on. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy to have you. I want to start right away with your bio, which I thought was so interesting. And here's why. Because in your bio, you introduce yourself as a Sierra Leonean, Ghanaian, British bookstagrammer. And what really struck me about your bio was that you begin with your heritage instead of with your job, as so many people do, or, or your relation to other people. So many people say, you know, student, wife, mother, or um, gardener, this, that, or something. Mm. You know what I'm saying? But you start yeah. writing that with your heritage, which I thought was so interesting. Tell me why those titles come first for you. Um, I think I'm just as somebody that has grown up um, in three different countries. And I'm very proud of my heritage and where I've come from. Um, so interestingly, I was born in Sierra Leone, but I actually grew up in Guinea, which is where my dad is from. So my mother was from Sierra Leone, my dad is from Guinea. <laughs> um, so um, technically, um, so I then grew up in, um, in Guinea until I was about 12. And then I went back to Sierra Leone for another four years before I then came over here to England, UK, um, and have been here since. So been here for, I think, maybe 12 years. So I am, although... Technically, I am um, officially a British. <laughs> I still keep the other two. They are very much important um, to me. And I think it's a way of always reminding myself where I come from and wanting to kind of always keep those two places that are so important and dear to me uh, with me always. Tell me about the role that reading played in your life growing up. Was your, did you, do you come from a family of readers? Um, over here, my, oh, my family, is so big and multicultural, multi different countries. Um, so over here in the UK, my family based over here. Yes, actually, um, loads of us are readers and I always love when we get together and everybody has a book that they're currently reading mm -hmm. and it's quite, it's a joy, it's a joyful thing for me. Um, whenever we get together and sometimes I've done it over the years I'll take a picture of all the books that we're reading and share it on bookstagram to kind of see yeah so um, over here definitely um, but reading for me it, it definitely started when I was um, in Sierra Leone so maybe hmm, I think maybe about yeah 13 14 um, I think I can clearly remember reading some Mills and Boone's books I probably shouldn't have been reading at that <laughs> age. Because <laughs> um, I don't know, they were easily accessible, I guess. And I, I have this clear memory of like, we'll be working, um, walking from like a friend's house or from my house or a friend's or to visit a, another relative. And I'll be walking and reading. That's where I'll get that ability from. Oh my um, gosh. I, yeah, because I was so like just sucked in into this world, even if it was in a Mills and Boone's or another different book. And I just remember this just being so 
um, lost into the world that I'll just be walking and reading. And I've still, I think I've still maintained that ability now. I don't do it as often, <laughs> but yeah, I clearly remember that. Um, but then I got into school and I think you have loads of bookstagram has actually mentioned this or people that are bookworms kind of saying like the education system, especially people that have done maybe degrees in English or focus on literature, kind of it killed their love for reading for a little bit. Um, so that kind of happened to me. But when I first came over here, because I wasn't in school, I think it took a while to get me into school, the system over here. The reading was my sanctuary because I wasn't doing anything else. And um, me and my um, stepmom, who I refer to as mom, were actually talking about it recently. And my sister was saying like how I used to be at the library all the time because I, I didn't have any friends of my own. I was in a new country, even though I had my dad over here. I was kind of getting to know um, another side of my family here. Um, so reading, I started by reading my sister's like books that she had around and then I got introduced to the library and that was just, and I was reading just, I think I was going into the library maybe two, three times a week and I was reading so many books a week. So I think that reignited my love of reading um, again when I came over here. Um, and then more recently it was probably when I did create my bookstagram, I think maybe about three years ago. I got back into it and I thought, and I was sharing my books on my personal page. And then one day just randomly sort of discovered, I was like, bookstagram, what is this? <laughs> and, um, and the rest is history. So yeah, that's kind of my history um, has been like with reading. Yeah. In those days when you were going to the library all the time mm. and, and finding that as your sanctuary when you were in a new country, did you mm. lean toward any particular genre or were you just picking up everything that came into your path? Um, yeah, I think when, because I started with my little sister's book that she kind of had around. So I probably read lots of like YA, probably younger than my age. Mm -hmm. um, which is interesting coming from Mills and Boons when I was younger to then going into YA and younger. So I probably say YA and then I, um, I probably then moved on to, I read lots of YA, lots of romance, and then I moved on to paranormal romance because I like the idea of like fantasy and romance. So yeah, I think I probably read yeah, lots of paranormal romance, actually. Lots. I have some uh -huh. like favorite authors in that genre that I'm that now and then when I'm in a reading slump, I pick up their book. It's just so familiar and nice. So it is it has been an, an interesting um reading um journey. But I think it also with age as well. I think the mm -hmm. um because there's some books now that are my favorite and the genre that I read probably five years ago, I probably wouldn't have picked them up. I probably would have been like, oh, no, that's not my sort of book. Oh, no, I couldn't read that. Mm -hmm. um, I was definitely, some of those books are now my favorite kind of books to read. And some of those authors are now my favorite authors to read. Mm -hmm. So I think Instagram or the bookstagram side of it has definitely helped widen my taste and in some way, like helped change it as well. Most of my, when most of my friends recommend a book, I automatically read it because I know them and I know, well, if you like it, I'm going to like it. And that's how yeah. I feel about a lot of bookstagrammers. And if you're following a wide range of bookstagrammers, you're automatically, your reading, I think is going to change because you yeah. have this instinct, you know, I read your bookstagram and when you like books, I think I have liked a lot of books that she's like, so I'm going to check this mm. one out. Yeah. even though it would not have come across my radar otherwise. And that's an incredible thing that Bookstagram, I think, is doing in terms of yeah. widening everyone's ranges. Also, the fact that I feel like it's one of the, not that it's not without its its own problems, but it's mm -hmm. one of the nicest little corners of the internet. I feel like people are just so open and um, just like friendly. And yeah, definitely, it just, it widens your taste. It, it, it gets you out of your comfort zone. You mm. read books that you never would have read. You read more stories, and which I, I just think reading far and wide is so important. Um, you you learn about different cultures, different ways of life, and you learn new things. And some books can teach you things, and some books can be life changing. So it's good to have this corner 
of the internet of different people sharing what they're reading. So tell me, how did you come across this book that we're discussing today, So the Path Does Not Die? Or it could have been I was looking up for Sierra Leonean authors who I know don't get as much sort of attention as some other yeah. parts of um, um, the African literature scene. So it could have been and then came across him and, um, and found this book. Could you give a, a brief summary of the plot for our mm -hmm. um, listeners who have not heard of this book? Yeah, so um, the book is So the Path Does Not Die by P. D. Hollis. Um, and basically it's about um, Fina, um, who kind of after a broken initiation, it kind of follows her from that, her journey, um, moving from their village to the city and then finding herself over to the US and then sort of them making the decision to come back home. And it's kind and it just beautifully explores her journey because everything kind of stems from that moment, from that broke initiation. She feels like um, everything that kind of her, her journey or everything that's gone wrong in her life or hasn't gone to plan has to do with what happened on that fateful night. Um, so it, it's an intercontinental um, story um, that deals with um, um, womanhood tradition versus, um, I, I don't know, modern ideas, but I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not sure modern ideas is the right word, but it definitely deals with tradition. Um, and it's like also like making your own way like choosing what path is right for you or choosing your own path apart from what is the normal. And it also obviously deals with um, race. But it also, which I noticed today, it deals with tribalism as well, which for some reason I didn't get the first time. And I was really, I was like, ah, yes, it does do this. And it is something that I'm, I'm aware of as well. But yeah, I noticed that. So it does deal with um, quite... Um, important teams but without I don't feel like it overwhelmed the story or it came across as preachy um, I think it did it quite well you use the word um, initiation can we talk a little bit about this because I was so interested in this um, mm. coming from the perspective of a white western woman and yeah I, I what that it, what initiation means is what the way we always say it here is female genital mutilation. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I FDM, thought, yeah. yeah, and I thought that was going to dominate the book. Yeah. And it was so fascinating to me that it doesn't. And it was also no. fascinating to me that Fina does not let anyone reduce her to that terminology or to that conversation. Yes she has a very specific conversation with a very important person in her life where she says, yes, you don't understand what you're talking about. This is not yeah. your culture. It turned around everything. Didn't turn around everything I've always thought, but it mm. made me think very differently. It made me stop and yeah. say, I don't, I don't have any idea what I'm talking about this. We have this no. gut reaction yeah. Yeah. to this topic. I think it's very fascinating that you, you immediately use the word initiation you use the word that she uses for it yeah. and that her yeah. family uses for it. Yes. Um, and I think I say, as somebody obviously that um, grew up um, on the continent, but I understand the other side of the conversation. Um, but also I grew up until I was, what age did I come over? 15. Um, I had a different idea of this. So I think that's why whenever I talk about it on what, well, in the, instance of this book obviously I refer to an initiation but if we're having a conversation about FGM I probably will refer to it as that but in the context of this story and from me growing up like around it and be aware of it I have a different idea um, those ideas are probably not the same now than to what they were but mm. I completely understood especially that conversation that happened between her and um, another character. Mm -hmm. I really liked that conversation. Um, I thought it was done like really well because it's it's much more complex, um, especially for people that grew up on the continent. 
um, this topic. It's not as simple as I think, which is what he, um, the autopedia holist kind of tried to show via these two characters. Because you have one person that is grown up in the Western world and has a very set and different idea and kind of a more almost simplest, simplistic um, kind of approach and understanding to it. And then you have somebody who come from the traditional side of things. And I also liked how um, she challenged um, the other character about, well, the um, the male um, side of it as well. I, I love it when a book does that, when a book makes me stop and think, you don't know, what you know is only what you know. You yeah, know exactly. This side of it, you haven't lived through it. And it, it, it just mm. made me stop and think, I don't know this story. And mm -hmm. so this is something that I should not just say that I know this is the way it should be, which is what we always yeah. do. Yeah, yeah. Another thing that I forgot to mention was um, it also what he deals with is this relationship between um, Africans and African-Americans. Mm -hmm. I, I noticed that a bit more this second reading. And there's a history of this relationship. In, in the real world as well. But I liked how that was explored as well. Um, I thought um, he dealt with like this. And even not just um, Africans and African-Americans, where you have Africans and then people from the Caribbean, like, mm -hmm. and there's right. this different relationship to each other. And I just loved how that was um, explored. It felt like home. And this book really is about that, isn't it? It's 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 like what what does home mean? And I think there's a beautiful quote: "To be at home means knowing oneself and sharing that self with others." And I just thought that was so beautiful. Um, and yeah, for some people, because I, I feel like home is not necessarily just one place. Like you can you carry home with you, and I feel like that quote. Um, kind of encompasses that that feeling um, so yeah no it, it is really about all of them trying to find out especially the kind of other main characters in the book where they belong and um, in this world and how do you go on about creating their own path. Do you and your family get to travel back to Africa often? Actually I haven't been since mm. for 12 years now so oh. I am desperate to be able to go hopefully in the next few years. But the thing is, if I go back, I have to visit two countries. I can't, <laughs> yes. so yeah, <laughs> That's a big trip. I can't, I have family in both countries. I have my grandma and my aunties and uncles in, um, in Guinea. And I have my um, half um, siblings and my uncles and aunties in, um, in Sierra Leone. So it, it would be a big trip for me, um, mm. but I, I am desperate. Um, to go back but it will be very interesting because let's say I go back by the time I will have been 15 years here it will look completely different to because I left as a teenager and I'll be going as a grown adult I'll probably be in my 30s um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so it will be a very interesting um, experience that I I'm very I cannot wait um, to hopefully do that soon but yes, I am hoping to go soon and see family and, and just be home. It's amazing. Like I've been here for 12 years and this is home as well. UK is home. Um, I am British, but um, where I was born and grew up and the other country that I, I, both countries that I grew up in, I still very much think of them as home. I cannot mm. separate the three. It occurred to me as I was reading this, I don't think I've ever read a Sierra Leonean author. I think all of the African literature I've read, is it possible it's all from Nigeria? I think. Yeah, it... Niger Nigerians, <laughs> I love them. I love them. But yes, they dominate. They dominate the literature scene. Yeah, they, they dominate the African literature scene. They do. And they're amazing writers. Um, but yes, and then after them, you've got like the Caribbeans, the Caribbeans as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that was another reason why I wanted to choose this book because um, I was like there's other books that I think as well are the best book ever best book ever 
my mission was kind of like, I want to read more authors from my own countries. I want to try and share them and encourage people to like seek out um, more than just the kind of literature that is dominating the books that are dominating the scene. Um, so yeah, that was another reason why I chose it. Cause I was like, I doubt she would have read this. <laughs> mm, no, had never even heard of it. And that was why I chose this book. Cause I'm like, it's a very underrated book, um, but it is one that meant so much to me. And I'll be like, it'd be good to um, kind of revisit it and discuss it with um, with somebody and give it a little bit of uh, a light that it deserves. <laughs> it's just, it's, I think it's just amazing discovering new authors and new works and yes. reading about topics or um, situations that you would never, ever normally pick up. And I think for us as humans and a society, it's, it's, just, it's, the, it's just the best and um, I encourage more people to do it. <laughs> I feel like you are better off for it. <laughs> okay, there's one more thing I really want to talk to you about with regards to mm. this book. And given that you are also a British woman, in mm. addition to all of your other identities, I think you're yep. going to appreciate this question on several levels. Um, I have been watching The Crown. It just released mm. over here in the United States. And I have been reading it. Yep newly released book called HRH, which is an examination of um, the fashion choices of Queen Elizabeth, Princess Diana, Kate Middleton, and mm. um, Meghan Markle. Mm-hmm. And this, this book is all about how every single thing they wear means something or points to something else. Mm-hmm. And um. And, and so I'm watching that and also reading the HRH book. And as I was reading So the Path Does Not Die, I could not help but notice all the talk about fashion. And I went to yeah. Wikipedia <laughs> a million times to look up what exactly does this particular outfit look like or what does this particular cloth look like? I thought it was so interesting Mm. that he focused so much on West African specifically, but not entirely, but um, Mm. West African fashion. And I was wondering if you noticed that and if it meant anything to you or if if it was something you really enjoyed in the book as well. Yeah, oh, I definitely noticed that. I noticed that the first time around. And I remember (laughs) when I was reading it the first time around, I was like, I can see there was this event that happened, not to give spoilers to people if they want to watch it. So I would just say it's an event. And I was like, I can see this event clearly in my mind. Like it was so the imagery and everything. And obviously when you're familiar familiar with it, it's easier to kind of picture um, uh-huh. what he's trying to convey. And I just remember, I'm like, oh, I miss it. And <laughs> it was it was taking me back um, to those sort of events that I've attended as a child. I, I miss, I miss, um, I still have some of actually my like traditional um, African clues here with me, although I don't wear them as often. And now and then my grandma in Guinea will send me some clothes. Mm. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, I really appreciated that. And I thought that was written like so well, um, especially for people that are familiar with it. You, you'd be like, oh yes, mm-hmm. I, yeah, I know this. <laughs> I know this scene. I know this setting. It's going down. Yeah. <laughs> it's going down. Yeah. <laughs> and that was what I loved about it too. That really transcends is this is what the grannies wear and yeah. this is what the young people wear. And I yeah. thought that was so, and, and so I don't know beautiful. anything about fashion, but it was, I love what it means and what it signifies. Yeah. And I thought he did that yeah. so well in this book. You know, the food too. The food was the other thing. Oh, my uh, God. Yes. <laughs> me too. Me too. I was like, oh, I need to, um, I need to get, I, cause I have a, like an Indian African shop, um, um, near us. And to be honest, this takes me back to when I first discovered that shop existed because I had been here for a few years. I think it was just after I moved out of home for the first time. I was living on my own. And I discovered because I was like, you know, craving food from back home and stuff. Mm. And I discovered I was like, oh, oh my gosh, they have cassava leaves here. They have this (laughs) and they have they have plantain. I'm in heaven. (laughs) And I think I remember like posting it on my Facebook because I was so happy. (laughs) And I was like, this is the best. And that feeling I remember reading this the first time that feeling came back and I was like, 
I need to cook some of this stuff. It's it's really well done because none of these foods are um, part of my history at all. And I no. still spent the entire book going, I need to learn how to make that. That sounds yeah. <laughs> good. It really is a very joyful celebration, I thought. Yeah, I really love that. That that was nice. Yeah, it was nice to, um, as she said, like so much of the book is deal with in, dealing with heavy stuff. So yes. that was really nice to kind of have that. Although I feel like overall, overall yeah, overall, <laughs> the book is, um, I don't know, I wouldn't say not uh, joyful in a way, mm-hmm. I think, because um, of how it ends and um, sort of how, how finding our own, our own um, path, because she does at the end of it. And I think like the journey wasn't easy, but the kind of overall um, ending was, um, yeah, it was like, it was an, it was a nice one. Susie, will you tell me, what are you reading these days? Well, at the moment, actually, I am, I, I was reading the autobiography of Malcolm X, um, mm. but I was reading the end of all, no, not end of August, end of October. And I put it down because I was like, it's fantastic, by the way. Nothing with the writing or anything. It's incredible. And I will be going back to pick it up and finish it. But I think with this year, I've been looking for kind of less emotionally taxing, um, especially around uh, kind of coming towards the end of the year. I'm like, I just, I want more books that just give me joy. Um, mm-hmm. And one of the books that I recently read and loved was Love in Color. It's a short story collection mm-hmm. and it's by Bolu Babalola. and it was just it was a delight it was just a delight and it was just this um it's a a mythical tales from around the world retold and it was just beautiful and yeah I just enjoyed that and I think especially this year for all of us like whatever gives you joy like grab it and like don't put too much pressure on yourself if your usual books that you read or is not doing it like pick up something else that bring you a little bit of joy um take take up some anxiety so yeah um so I really love that and I think I've also been reading probably yeah I've read more poetry this year than ever I used to read them like for school Mm -hmm. yeah I found that poetry this year yeah I've read I'm trying to think how many collection maybe five or four or five possibly collections that I've read and I hadn't read poetry since back in school. So maybe when I was hmm, 18, 19 was probably mm-hmm. the last time. And I started off with, um, what was it? Questions for Ada, which is a beautiful, beautiful um, collection about womanhood, healing, um, joy. Um, it's also about um, um, children of the diaspora. And it was just, it was like a a healing collection. And one of those that I think whenever you're feeling a bit down, you need a bit of nourishment in the form of words. Mm. It's a good one to just pick back up again and like, and dive in. So that was beautiful. And then recently, I think just maybe last week, I read two poetry collections that kind of spoke to each other. I read, um, what was it? I read Poor by Caleb um, Femi which is a new um, collection that just came out and it kind of like a poetry collection, but it's got some photos in there as well. And um, that was beautiful. And I listened to him on a podcast and he recommended um, Surge by Jay Bernard, which I had on my shelf for like two years Uh (laughs) and had it read. And he mentioned it because I loved his collection so much. I was like, oh, I'm going to pick it. And it's quite a slim um, um, collection. That one was just um, amazing as well. And they kind of spoke to each other because they're speaking about um, people, like as we refer to here in council estates, from the perspective of somebody that has actually lived in those tower blocks and how they're treated and how they're looked at um, from the outside world. And um, he just like takes charge of the narrative. And um, I really like enjoyed the collection and some of the poems in that was amazing. And then the surge as well kind of deals with the same thing, um, but it focuses on the, 
in um invent incident that happened where people died like in a fire at a, a party to this day is believed it was a racial attack but the government did nothing about it i think the writer herself like went through archives and stuff and ended up writing this poetry collection that is mainly based around that and some of the poems made me sob there was a mm. poem there i think it's, it's the perspective of um a dad that has lost a son and then it's kind of from the perspective of the dead child and it was just heart-wrenching to read and I think it was even more sad when you know it like based on actual true events that have happened and that was the same thing with Paul as well actually he says loads of all of his poems are pretty much based on things that have happened um so they're real um I don't know, got punched, they hit that much harder when you know this is not just somebody's imagination but based upon their, either their own experiences or other people's experiences that they've read about and then written about. But yeah, um, poem poetry collections have been a balm to the soul. And I love that you use the phrase that these two books are in conversation with each other. I've never heard that before, but that I, I love the notion that there is sort of a communion Maybe not even between the authors, but between the books themselves. Yeah, um, I think that actually has been, um, it's a bookstagram that I've already mentioned before, but Books and Rhymes, Sarah mm -hmm. at Books and Rhymes, she does a podcast as well. And um, she does this IG Lives and she always kind of um, recommend books and talk about books that are most of the time in conversation with each other. And wow. it's where that I've now got this, like idea or like to look or to like um to kind of see that more um kind of open my eyes to that they are like books that are in direct conversation with each other that are out there not by the same authors um but if you read them it's like oh this book yeah this they're kind of talking about the same thing but in completely different ways right. and it's it's a beautiful experience to kind of read both and um and get that this has been so wonderful and I knew it would be. I was so excited to talk to you and I want to thank you for joining me today. Will you tell our listeners where they can find your wonderful reading account online? Yeah, um, before that, just thank you so much for asking me to be on. Um, this is my first ever podcast. Oh, <laughs> yes, you're a pro. Um, I've, <laughs> I've enjoyed this conversation so much um, and it's been a delight. Um, you can find me on Instagram on the ASB, the bookworm. It's wonderful. It's one of my very favorite book accounts to follow. I get so many ideas oh, from you. you so Thank oh, you thank for you joining so me today. And thank you so much for introducing me to this book. That's what we are for, bookworms, eh? That's right. <laughs> Just influence each other to buy more books and read more. <laughs> That's right. And I'm so oh. glad you did. Thank you so much, Susie. Thank you for having me. It's been great. Loved it. Thanks for listening, bookworms. For more information on this episode and links to all the books we discussed, please go to our website, bestbookeverpodcast.com. Or follow the podcast on Instagram at Best Book Ever Podcast. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and you can find me everywhere as Julie wrote a book. Remember, when you're doing your book shopping, please help support indie bookstores and this podcast by using my affiliate link at bookshop.com slash bestbookever. Thanks for joining me today, and I will see you at the library. <laughs>